chapter 16 talks about proteins, um, and specifically amino acids, proteins, and enzymes. So amino acids are the building blocks for proteins. So amino acids build proteins, and then enzymes are a specific type of proteins that do functions um, physiologically in our body. So they kind of help make processes work. So if you look over here on the right of this slide over here, this is going to be an example of a protein, what it looks like whenever you link amino acids together. So we'll talk about the structure of amino acids and proteins more in a minute, but what I want you to point out here is that there is kind of a repeating unit here, and I kind of like to read it as um, NH, CH with an R group, and then C double bond O. Then you have another one right after that that's another NH, CH with an R group, and C double bond O. So this is going to be your repeating unit. This is going to be a repeating amino acid unit in a protein. Um, so by the time we get to the end of the chapter, you should be able to come back to this one and kind of identify this repeating unit and kind of have an idea of kind of how it gets there, I guess, is a good way to say it. So that being said, let's start by, in general, talking about proteins and introducing them, and then we'll talk some about um, the individual amino acids. So proteins themselves account for about 50% of the dry weight of the human body. So if you were to take all the water out of you, because we're mainly water, uh, the stuff that's left, about 50% of that is going to be proteins. They have many different functions in the body, ranging from structural functions to help you know, our cells kind of maintain shape, to allow muscle contractions, um, to having enzymatic functions that allow us to like... Uh, have synapses and have neurons fire and things of that nature. Um, unlike lipids and carbohydrates or sugars, proteins aren't stored. Remember, we could store our lipids and fat cells and carbohydrates we could store as glycogen. But for proteins, they're not stored. So we have to consume those daily. So proteins need to be an important part in your diet. Um, they can be found in meat, fish, beans, nuts, things like that. Um, so you have to ingest them in order to be able to use them to make new proteins. Some examples of proteins in our body, and we'll talk a little bit more later in the chapter about um, hemoglobin and myoglobin specifically, um, but here's some other examples. You don't really need to know these in detail. We'll actually talk about keratin and collagen a little bit as well. Um, these are just some proteins that have um, functions you may have heard of, right? You may have heard that hemoglobin carries oxygen. You might know that myoglobin stores oxygen. Um, actin and myosin are involved in regulating muscle contractions. You've probably heard of insulin at some point, which is a protein hormone. It's a smaller little um, peptide, really, that is involved in controlling blood sugar levels. So all of these are different types of proteins that are important um, in our function as humans. All right, so how are these proteins built? So they're built from amino acids. Amino acids have two main components to them. They have the amino component, and they have the acid component. The amino component is this amine group, this NH2 group, and the acid component is a carboxylic acid, which is that COOH. So an amino acid is going to be a combination of an amine group and then the middle part here is referred to as the alpha carbon. You can see the arrow pointing to it. And that alpha carbon has what we refer to as this R group. That R group is also sometimes referred to as a side chain. And this is going to be what determines what specific amino acid you're looking at. So this varies from amino acid to amino acid. This varies and is used to determine what amino acid it is that we're looking at. So this determines your identity of the amino acid. All right, so whenever you are trying to identify an amino acid, you would look specifically at that R group. All right, so your amino acid is going to have your amine group, NH2, the R group, so it's really CH attached to an R group, and then C double bonded to O, bonded to OH, which is your carboxyl group. All right, the simplest amino acid out there is glycine. The reason we say it's the simplest is because the side chain is just a hydrogen, and the hydrogen is the smallest atom there is, right? The smallest element on the periodic table. 
Um, so in addition to um, glycine, we have 19 other amino acids, which we're all going to have different side chains. So again, we determine the amino acid based on that side chain. Uh, we're going to go through these in a couple slides here and kind of look at them and identify them. Um, most of them are going to be neutral, so we can kind of classify these amino acids as neutral, or they can be basic or acidic. And I want to touch base really quickly on this um, basic and acidic ones. The basic ones are going to be amines. Right, so it says here, if R is equal to a basic nitrogen atom, well, nitrogens are amines, right? And that means it's going to be able to, if it's a base, remember bases are proton acceptors. So that means it's going to accept a proton, and that's going to mean that these ones are going to have a plus charge. All right? Now, if it has an additional COOH group, these are carboxylic acids. So remember, carboxylic acids, so these are going to be carboxylic acids. Right, so carboxylic acids. An acid is a proton donor. So this can go from a COOH or it can end up going to COO minus. Right, so this would have a negative charge. So the side chains to these amino acids can be neutral like it is with glycine and most of the others, or they can have charges. So whenever we get to look at the amino acid, that's something I want you to be looking for when we talk about those. All right. So before we talk about the 20 um, amino acids, I want to kind of go over kind of ways you might see these. So a lot of times the amino acids, instead of writing out their full name like glycine, it can be written in either a three-letter code, like in this case GLY, or even a one-letter code, which for glycine would be G. Now you guys don't have to memorize these codes. This will be given to you. It's on that um, exam the formula sheet that you have. So you don't have to memorize those, but just kind of know that that's some place you might need to look to be able to identify particular amino acids within um, a protein, for instance. All right, so we're, there's 20 amino acids that occur naturally in proteins. Of those 20, humans can synthesize 10 of them from scratch. The other 10 we call essential amino acids, and just like essential fatty acids that we talked about um, in a previous chapter, Whenever we say something is essential, it means that they need to be consumed in our diet. And this is why um, it's important to eat proteins, not only because we can't store them, but because even if we were to break down proteins that are already existing in our body, we do need to have this constant influx of um, amino acid for these essential amino acids that can only come from our diet. Okay, so now let's go through and look at the amino acids. So the first few slides here are all going to be neutral amino acids. So neutral specifically meaning that the side chain is uncharged. And one thing I wanted to point out before we start looking at all those is that I pointed out that the side chain is uncharged. But look at the amine group and the carboxylic acid group on these amino acids. And you'll notice that, that what you saw previously as an NH2 is now an NH3+. Plus. So this used to be an NH2, right? But in normal physiologic conditions, like at normal cellular pHs, which is around pH 7.2 to 7.4, um, these exist, the amine group exists in this protonated state. In other words, it has gained an H+. Plus. So it has acted as a base, Right, bases are proton acceptors and it's gained an H plus. Whereas this carboxylic acid group, right, you used to see that on the previous slides as COOH. This has actually lost the H plus. So it has acted as an acid and donated the proton, and it's going to be at COO minus. So I want to point that out to you. We'll talk about that a little bit more um, later on in the chapter. But it's a really important concept to not get too confused in looking at these structures. So with all that being said now, I want to go through and start looking at the R groups. So the R group for alanine is going to be CH3, right? So it's just a methyl group. Um, for asparagine, it's a CH2CONH2. Again, you do not need to memorize these side chains. They're on the uh, formula or final exam sheet that's posted on Blackboard that you have access to. Um, things that I want you to remember, uh, particularly about asparagine, not really even remember, but you should be able to identify it, 
based on that CONH2, that is an amide, right? So you should be able to see that as an amide. Similarly with glutamine down here, CONH2 is an amide. So in other words, what that looks like is C double bonded to O bonded to an NH2, and that C is going to be attached to the CH2 on the other side of it over there. So those are what those two look like. We already talked about glycine with just the H. Um, an important one, and I'm going to even do this one in a different color so you know it's important, is cysteine. So cysteine has this SH group that's over there. So that's going to be important whenever we start looking at proteins, once these amino acids are in proteins, because cysteine, because of that SH, can form what we refer to as a disulfide bond. So a disulfide bond. So notice it has a sulfur in it. That's where that, term, that sulfide comes from. So a disulfide bond is something that cysteine can form. So anytime you see or hear disulfide bond, you should be thinking about cysteines because that's the only amino acid that can form the disulfide bonds. All right, so going to the next slide, um, isoleucine and leucine are isomers of each other. They're constitutional isomers, so they have the same chemical formula. They're just kind of organized a little bit differently. Um, methionine is another one that has a sulfur, but it is not able to form the disulfide bonds that we just talked about with cysteine. It's because it doesn't have an SH, right? It has an SCH3, so it doesn't, it's not able to work the same as a cysteine can. Um, phenylalanine has a benzene group attached to it. And then the most interesting one on this page is going to be the proline. So proline here, um, if you notice, all of the other ones have that same kind of backbone where it's NH3+, plus, CH with an R group, and COO-. So you look down here at proline and you don't see it. Um, it's still kind of there. So instead of NH3+, plus, it's an NH2+. Plus. And the reason that extra H isn't there is because instead of an H, what we have is a CH2, a CH2, and another CH2, which ends up linking that nitrogen to the CH group, which is right there. So that one is going to be the CH just like this CH or just like that CH, right? So those CHs are the same one as that one kind of in the middle of that skeletal structure you see there. And the COO minus is the same, right? So what happens is, while all of the other amino acids kind of have that linear type backbone with the NH3 plus CH with an R group COO minus, proline has kind of a bridge that's formed by the R group that connects the amine right there and the C, that alpha carbon, that CH that's in the middle. So the bridge are those kind of the CH2s that are circled here, here, and here. So the main thing about proline is not really understanding necessarily the details of all of that, but knowing that it's different in terms of its shape and the fact that it forms kind of that um, ring type structure uh, with the side chain to connect the nitrogen and that other carbon. All right, so now the last slide here, talking about the neutral amino acids, um, you have serine, threonine, valine, tryptophan, and tyrosine. And I want to link serine, threonine, and tyrosine together because they're all alcohols with an OH group there. Um, and then valine and tryptophan are both kind of... Um, not have nonpolar side chains that don't do a whole lot. I know tryptophan has an NH here. Um, however, it's one of those things because of this benzene ring that's over there, that NH that's in um, tryptophan really isn't able to do isn't able to do that much. So we kind of consider this um, it doesn't have a whole lot of the properties that a typical amine would have. All right, so speaking of kind of our more unique side chains. Um, next come the acidic side chains. So the acidic side chains, as I talked about earlier, ones are going to have a carboxylic acid in the side, side chain. So carboxylic acid or COOH. So the carboxylic acid, again, carboxylic acid is COOH, but what you see on the side chain here 
is COO minus. And that's because acids donate a proton. So they have lost minus the H plus in the side chain. Now, they're not always in this COO minus state. Sometimes aspartic acid could have a COOH, and sometimes glutamic acid would have a COOH. So they can go back and forth between that acid state where it has the H and kind of the conjugate base state where it has the COO minus. And actually, in case you hear me talk about it or hear someone else talking about it, they usually are referred to differently. So aspartic acid is when it's going to have a COOH, and aspartate is when it's going to be COO minus. And for glutamic acid, you have glutamic acid, which is going to be the COOH form, and then glutamate is going to be the COO minus form. Right? So glutamate, COO minus. So in case you hear that language, you'll understand what it is it's talking about. It's because you're talking about that conjugate base with it. All right, so the main, most important thing here is understanding that the acidic side chains have carboxylic acids, and they can have a negative charge, right? So basically right there is your negative charge. All right, now the last slide talking about the amino acids are going to be our basic amino acids. So basic amino acids, these are going to be the ones that are amines. Remember, amines can act as bases, meaning that they can gain an H+. So typically, you're going to have something that looks like kind of something bound to a carbon, and then the carbon is going to be bound to a nitrogen. Let's just call this an NH2, and usually this will be like a CH2. This would be, for instance, lysine down here. So I know lysine, it says CH24. So imagine this is the last of those CH2s, and it's attached to an NH2. Well, the NH2 would typically have a lone pair of electrons down there. And then because it's a base, it can grab an H+, plus, which means it's going to form, there's my squiggle, the CH2, the last of the CH2s. And then instead of an NH2 now, instead of that lone pair, it's going to grab an H+. Plus. So that is the NH3+, plus that is on lysine, right? The NH3 plus that's there, that is our NH3 plus that is formed from it acting as a base. So arginine and histidine work similarly. Um, for arginine, instead of an NH3 plus, it's actually going to be an NH2 plus only because that carbon has a double bond to that nitrogen. So nitrogen usually forms three bonds, so usually there's one bond to the um, to a hydrogen and then two bonds to the carbon. So whenever it grabs an extra H+, plus, that one only forms an NH2. And then for histidine, notice the histidine doesn't even have an NH plus on it. It's because histidine at normal physiologic pHs is usually just in this, um, in the base form where it hasn't grabbed the extra H, but the extra H to, can go right there where it can form an H+. Plus. So this is where you can form that extra H plus for your histidine. So again, for your basic amino acids, they're amines. Amines can bind an extra proton or an H plus, which means that these can have positive charges. Whereas your acid side chains, your carboxylic acids, can donate a proton and they can have a negative charge to them.